My great pleasure to introduce Nancy Sandler from Ohio University. I've known Nancy for several years, but five, six years, and uh, we, you know, met at the petrol field with caffeine. So, um, so let me introduce Nancy very briefly. So Nancy got her PhD at the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign um, with Eduardo Fratti, who's a well-known name correlated to electric physics. And then she um, had research positions in Paris, in the Colmar Mar Superior, and at Brandeis, which is a year Boston. Um, and after that, she joined the faculty of Ohio University, which is in Athens, Ohio, one of the campuses, perhaps the biggest one, of the higher university system. And Athens, Ohio is a great town, home to our own Peter Harvish. Um, um, and um, so Nancy has contributed to many branches of theoretical physics over the last 15 years or so. And I just want to mention a couple. So she's particularly interested in Conway effect, and most recently in graphene rings, and in general in the area of quantum dots. Um, and nano ribbons and related nano physics topics. And then she's also worked a lot in the area of fractional Hall effect and latent liquids earlier. So she's contributed to many, many areas of theoretical physics. I'm delighted to have you. So thank you for coming. Um, and we have a small present for you, you know, appreciation for the speaker. Wow, thank you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's not for me, it's for the department. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I'm having a wonderful visit and I, I will complete it tomorrow. I already enjoyed a lot of people chatting with them and they're learning a few things that are quite interesting. I, the title of my talk is that one, but it involves three big players. One player is in orbit another is Ondo, and the third is Graffi. And um, each of them is a world on its own, and I would be really happy if the students especially leave the room having a slight idea of what spin orbit, Ondo, and Graffi are, even if you don't even remember what I did about it, okay? If you just grab grasp the ideas, the concept in the, behind these three big words. Now, I am from Ohio University. We have two institutions that support my work also in Ohio University, the Condensed Matter and Surface Science Program and the Nano Scale and Quantum Phenomena Institute. And the work that I'm going to present today is, was funded by NSF. So, I know that we are right together but I am not responsible for this. I just <laughs> <laughs> nothing to do. It was here, it was in Athens too. So after that note, I want to start my talk with graphene. And I am sure that you know a lot about graphene, because it's a very popular topic. And when I started working in it, in the field, I, I like to know a little bit of the history of the materials. So I got a copy of this book, which is a very nice book, written by an engineer, that tells the story of the pencil, basically of graphite. And there I learned many facts about graphite, and later a little bit of the film, and the pencil mostly. And there are some things that stuck with me that I always like to mention when I talk about graphite. One is the fact that graphite was discovered in the 1500s by a couple of shepherds that realized that a piece of black stone was useful to make marks, but it was more useful because the marks could be erased. Okay? Before, before I continue, I am not an English native speaker, and I have a heavy accent, so if you don't understand me because of my accent, please interrupt me and ask me again. I am used to that, I teach. <laughs> so it will not be the first time, it's not the last one, and I am very okay with that. Okay? So, I was saying that the, the graphite, the stone, was found almost by chance, and people immediately discovered uh, how useful it was going to be. And in the book, I learned about how the pencil was introduced in the state. And I like this paragraph, especially because of the first sentence. In the beginning, there was the woman. <laughs> what can I say? As in all important discoveries, 
there was a woman behind. The interesting thing about this woman is that it was a school teacher who learned how to fabricate the pencil. And if you walk through the paragraph, you will see the, de oh, sorry, the details. You get confused with so many things. So, she learned how to make the powder and mix it with glue, basically, and put it in a case made of wood in order to write with it, which is not a trivial thing. This story has been recorded by many historians that there was a woman who did it for the, for the very first time. What I found very interesting is that the name of the woman was not recorded. So we don't know her name. Okay? We know the whole details, but not her name. What is most interesting is that after this was done, the fact one of the biggest uh, pencil factories in the States was owned by the family of Henry Thoreau, the poet, the author, and they made a fortune producing pencils, and he wrote a lot of pencils. So I found that quite interesting. Another thing that I found interesting in the history of the material is that although it was um, found in the 1500s and it was put to use immediately, okay, people were very, very aware of how important and useful this material was. The first calculation trying to describe the properties of the electrons moving in it and how the, the material properties could be predicted or understood came only 400 years later. The 1900s, and it was a very uh, numerical calculation that shows what were the possible states that the electrons could have in these materials at given energies. And it was almost a hundred years later that we could finally isolate one single monoatomic layer. The material, as you know, is a, like a, a stack of cards, you know, a set of layers that are coupled with each other. And we finally were able, almost by chance, or by chance, basically, able to isolate it. So it's, it's from the history point of view, you see that it took us quite a while to be able to reach the point where we can manipulate the material at such a detail that we can make um, much more useful applications and at the same time understand what's going on at these small scales. So, this is a brief outline of the talk. First, I want to tell you how I look at graphene from a theorist's point of view. And then I will try to answer the question, what is the condo effect for those of you who are not familiar with it? And why I am interested in condo and graphene in particular? And later on, I want to talk about the spin orbit interactions, with, which is a particular kind of interaction that affects spins. And then I will try to put the two together in graphene and see what I can learn about that. So, let me introduce the players. First, start with graphene and a theory model of it. For me, graphene is a lattice, a crystal lattice, that is made up of two atoms. It's a triangular lattice. And as any lattice, as you learn in the introduction to solid state, can be described, the electron cell can be described by a block theorem. We can find the eigenfunctions if we think that the electrons do not interact. This is a picture of the lattice. And this is a picture of the very one. So that tells me what type of momentum the electrons can have inside this crystalline structure. I know the chemical structure of carbon. Carbon has S and P orbitals. And the electrons in these orbitals mix, they hybridize, making two types of bonds. One type of bond are the so-called sigma bands, which are the bonds that live in the plane. Okay? And they have this trigonal structure. And the other types of bonds are, the, are formed in the pi band, which are basically the S orbitals mixed with, let's say, the PC orbital, the one that stacks outside the plane of graphene. Okay? So, normally one, uh, one considers the sigma bands to be very uh, rigid, it's very difficult to modify them, the, the, that bond is very strong, while the pi band is much more uh, easy to modify, okay? Electrons are more like free, jumping from side to side, I can deform, I can curve graphene a little bit so I can tilt the PC orbital and what's happening, carbon nanotubes for instance, so it's a little bit more flexible. Now, 
because I have two atoms per unit size, I need more than one wave function to describe what's going on. Because I need a two wave function object, people say that I need to work with spinners. Okay, these objects that refer to more than one component and that have a very fixed phase relation between them. Okay, in this case, the spinner, what I call a spinner, is a, an object that tells me in the upper part how much of the electron wave function lives in one sublattice and the lower, how much of the electron wave function lives in the other sublattice. And there is a very fixed phase relation between them because the electron lives in both. Okay, it's not that I can split the electron. Okay, that's what happens. Now, the other thing is going back to this um, energy momentum relation calculated in the 40s. Another characteristic of it is that, besides having a very weird shape, it has six vertices that look identical, but only two of them are really different from the motion of, from the dynamics of the electron point of view. And near these points that are known as the K and K prime points, if I look at how the energy depends on the momentum, it depends linearly. So these are two cones, okay? And I have a cone for positive energy and a cone for negative energy. Coming from, if you want, the valence band and the conduction band in a semiconductor language, more familiar language. Now, this relationship, this linear relationship, can be very well parameterized by a quantity that is the velocity, okay? And this velocity corresponds to the Fermi velocity that the electrons have, that is roughly 300th of the speed of light. If I put these two objects together, okay, and I go back to the books and look for equations that look similar to this, what I find is that these equations remind of the Dirac equation. Now, the Dirac equation, applied to Graphene, looks like this. I am, I am not going to derive it, but basically it looks like this. And why, what is the Dirac equation, basically? Well, the Dirac equation was the equation that Dirac proposed to, to solve the equivalent of the Schrodinger equation, that is particles moving free in space, but moving in such a way that the energy was relativistically invariant. That is, when he wrote the Hamiltonian, he applied the, the, the Lorentz transformation, and he found the same equation. And he also asked for the particles to satisfy fermionic statistics. Okay, in case of having more than one. And he found an equation that precisely predicts an energy momentum relation like this when the particles didn't have any mass. And the most important thing is that he found that with one wave function was not enough in contrast to the Schrodinger, but he needed more than one component. And that's why he introduced spinors. So that's basically the idea. Because of the similarity between the equations, if I plug a two-component object here, and I interpret the sigma in the original um, Dirac equation as a Pauli matrix telling me about the occupants in the sublattices, I am able to write an equation for the Hamiltonian that looks exactly as the Dirac equation for particles without mass. And this is the origin of talking about Dirac particles in graphene. Of course, they are not Dirac particles. The electrons in graphene, they are not Dirac. They are Dirac-like particles, okay, if we are going to be precise. So, this sigma is not the real spin. Dirac needed to introduce a, a quantum number that had the properties of an angular momentum, okay, and later on was associated with magnetic properties. Here, there is spin nowhere to be seen. I am not introducing a spin in this description at all. And my two objects, as I said, in this approximation, acquire a very definite phase relation that depends if I am sitting in one of these vertices that I call the K, K prime or in the other one, okay? So basically this is what people in the literature work with when they talk about the natural electrons in graphene. Now, why spin? Because of spintronics. Why spintronics in graphene? There was a proposal several years ago of using graphene as a good material to convey current information based on the spin degree of spin and not the charge. 99% of the things that we enjoy today are based on, on charge transport. We move charge particles here and there, and we can manipulate them very efficiently. There uh, can be for a long time the idea of can we do the same for speed. Why? Well, 
One of the reasons is that with SPIN, we may have a transfer of information in longer path than charge. SPIN is much, much more difficult to scatter or to destroy. Another reason is because we can produce more easily a tangled state with SPIN than the charge. We can produce a tangled state with SPIN. So we can convey, we have more information with SPIN. All the attempts to produce a uh, device based on this characteristic have failed. And the proposal for SPIN, and uh, we are still trying that, but the proposal for SPIN consisted of putting graphene sandwiched between two materials, a substrate, and materials whose magnetization could be manipulated. So we have a source and a drain material in which we can magnetize with a particular spin orientation, and then we have a material that has a strong spin orbit orientation uh, interaction in which we can change the magnetization of this middle piece by changing the gate voltage. So the idea would be, I inject electrons in graphene, and because they come from a source that is polarized, magnetically polarized, when these electrons come on this region, by changing an electric field, the existence of a spin orbit interaction, that I am going to explain a little bit later, would turn this spin around and make them the initial spin, the cap spin, completely opposite in the opposite direction. So if it reaches the drain, and the drain has the opposite magnetic orientation, this electron would not go through. Okay? However, if I change the length, or if I change the gate voltage, or if I change the drain, I could make this electron go through, this spin go through. Yes? So I, I must have missed something. I thought you said that the point of spin was that you didn't have to inject charge, but it sounds like you're injecting charge and using charge in the same way that we would use in a regular transistor. Well, you can inject, you can pass a current, okay? In a transistor you pass a current. Um, yeah, let me see how I answer that question. Let us keep the idea that if I were looking at the charge degree of freedom, this, instead of going in this straight path, the charge would be colliding with impurities or different all the way around, and it will be turned back. However, the spin information will be transferred, okay, via spin-spin interactions within the material. So it is a spin current, It's not... a spin current, okay. yeah. So, but, but keep in mind this simple-minded picture that I can, I, I can think of a spin as a little ball with, a, with an arrow attached to it, okay? That's, that's the image that I want to create. So, this was a proposal, a theory proposal, for having a spin current in graphene. And uh, the justification of using graphene was because graphene had very little spin orbit in itself that could deface this spin. And only uh, all this change in the spin in graphene could be produced by this material on top. Okay? So, nothing could be affected by, the, by graphene itself, but it could be perfectly manipulated from outside. Okay? Because there was no intrinsic mechanism in graphene that would produce the phasing of the spin degree of freedom. Now, experiments follow soon after. Experiments at room temperature were then tried to implement something similar. They put graphene on silicon dioxide. This was uh, in the group of Bartis. And they, they injected current with two um, electrodes that were magnetizable, cobalt, if I remember correctly, and they measured the voltage further along because they wanted to see if the polarized current that was injected from the electrodes, how long it lasted, okay, to measure basically the spin relaxation time. So, they observed where the electrodes were parallel or antiparallel, they measured the spin current at the end, they measured the current, the polarized current at the end, and they concluded that, yes, yeah, spin relaxation is uh, very long in graphene samples, and uh, it was promising for a, uh, for a spin transistor. Now, very long meaning of the order of microns, 10, 5 per microns, give or take. Longer in any case than any charge relaxation, okay? Now... Sorry, the, the relaxation length? The spin relaxation length, yeah. Yeah, the, the distance in which basically they measure 90% or 80% of the initial current. So more recently, similar experiments were carried out in France by the group of FERC, and they did something similar. You see the setup, now there are two electrodes, now they see the, the 
graphene is on top of silicon carbide, uh, it's a different substrate. And uh, what they measure, this quote in here, is what they call the magnetoresistance, which is the resistance for what direction of spin polarized current versus the uh, minus the, the, uh, the resistance with the polarized current in the different direction as a function of the magnetic field. And they, in this case, and this, this axis shows the relative constant, so it's this one, the difference over the sub, and they measure quantities at 1.5 Kelvin and spin relaxation length of 100 microns. So at very low temperature now, not at room temperature, this spin relaxation length really goes down. However, it doesn't get as low as theory would predict. So there are still mechanisms that are like slowing down this spin degree of freedom. Another experiment in the group of Kawakami uh, a couple of years ago did something similar, but instead of graphene, pure and pristine, in order to show that there were possible uh, scatter, spin scattering mechanisms that would produce the relaxation, they doped the graphene with hydrogen atoms. These hydrogen atoms, the idea is that they behave as magnetic impurities and they provide a spin scattering mechanism for the spin currents, so they send spin currents, spin polarized currents, and they measure basically how the, the resistivity changes uh, for different exposures of the hydrogen flux, and then they measure the resistance for uh, parallel spin currents and for opposite spin currents. And they measure for opposite spin currents a dip, while for parallel spin currents they don't measure a dip. And the interpretation of the experiments is that uh, when you have parallel spins, you have more scattering. When you have um, opposite spins, the electron can go, the spins can go through basically. Electrons can go through, there is no spin spin scattering. So, this was graphene and spintronics of graphene. Let me introduce you player number two. Player number two goes under the name of Cotto effect. This is one of the mechanisms that affects spins directly. So before getting into, Koto, uh, into the effect of Koto in, in this graphene thing, let me remind you what the Koto effect is. In the 30s, people were measuring resistance, resistivities of bulk materials, metals that were contaminated with impurities. And uh, not long after that, people were very familiar with what were the possible mechanisms that could avoid electrons going through. They say electrons can collide with impurities. Okay, how that would go with temperature? Well, it would at low temperatures, that collision rate would be constant, temperature independent. So the resistivity, the resistance should saturate at low temperatures. What happens if electrons were colliding with that, with ions? Okay, well, that would be an effect, that would slow the electrons down, but linearly in temperature. And what is the other possible mechanism of collisions that would slow the electrons down? Well, electrons colliding with electrons. What else is there? Ions, electrons, impurities. That's it. So if you do electron electrons, you will see that the dependence should go quadratic in temperature. So basically, people expected for the resistance of these materials to go and then saturate here. To a big surprise, Many materials, many experiments where the metals were contaminated with magnetic impurities, at least with atoms that have a net magnetic moment, what they found was the existence of a minimum. That then the resistance, was, the resistance went up and then saturated. So this minimum was a puzzle for many, many years. And the Jun Kondo, a Japanese physicist, said, well, what may be going on here is that if electrons interact with electrons, if they can collide, Okay. This, this temperature dependent was obtained up to a certain order in perturbation theory. And he asked himself, what if we go one order higher in perturbation theory? We do the calculation. And he did that. And what he found is that at the higher order in perturbation theory, this electron electron interaction produced an effective scattering process in which the speeds of the electrons matter. And this term produced a term that was logarithmic in temperature. Meaning that at low temperature, this process of where the spin of the electrons matter in the collision sends the resistance up. So the competition between a low air, a diminishing 
resistance versus temperature, and a logarithmic one give rise to the minimum. And he showed, he demonstrated this way the existence of the minimum. He, and that was the name of the effect. That's why the effect was called the Coldwell effect. Now, in his model, basically, he thought, well, I have free electrons, like free electrons, parabolic dispersion, uh, Schrodinger equation, nothing, nothing special, plus an atom. And how can I enforce, how can I justify the existence of this mechanism that depends on the spin? Well, the way that he found to justify was to say, if my magnetic atom has is singly occupied, I always will have a spin that is available for scattering. If I put two electrons in my impurity, in the orbital of my impurity, to cancel the spin, then I will not have two spins. I will not have enough spin. So I need to have only one spin in my impurity to provide this scattering mechanism. And how do I do that? Adding an interaction energy at the impurity side. Pay the penalty for having two electrons in the same orbital. And this penalty is what is known as the tamu, is the on-site electron-electron interaction. So that's why his problem involve free electrons plus one interacting side, if you will. That's the problem that we solve. And produce an effect kind of like that. An electron, if this is the spin at impurity, which is always simply occupied, an electron from the conduction bar to come close. Notice that the one that come close have always a spin opposite to the spin sitting at impurity because the other one is blocked by Pauli principle. Right? You cannot come to spins at the same time. So, but then the scattering process would happen in which the spins can flip. And as a consequence, the one that couldn't come close to impurity before, after the flipping, now can come. Okay? Can approach that side. In a sense, all the electrons are involved in this process. All the electrons are uh, aware of the presence of this impurity simply because this impurity cannot be occupied. What he envisioned was, as you lower the temperature, this process slows down. The electron comes, the spin comes, and spends a much longer time in this side, okay? Forming what some people originally called a virtual bounce state, and then eventually left. Now, the formation of this virtual bounce state, where the two spins work long enough together to form a singlet, is happening at a particular energy, or at a particular temperature, but we see the name of the cold temperature, okay? So, to put all these words in a more mathematical, formal way, basically, Anderson proposed to represent the system in terms of the Hamiltonian that includes the free electrons in the metal, the energy of the orbital at the purity side, plus the payment for the double occupancy, the have an interaction. And then a term that is called the hybridization term because it's the one that allows the hybridization between the electrons in the bar, the free electrons and the electrons of impurity. Now, if you try to solve this Hamiltonian in the appropriate regime of parameters, in the appropriate set of values of E, D, U, and T, you can which means, in other words, doing a stripper wall transformation, you can transform all this nasty Hamiltonian into a single one, in which you see you have two spin operators, one that accompanies, if you want, the wave functions at the impurity side, and one that accompanies the wave function of the electrons. So this is the spin-spin interaction between the electrons at the impurity and the electrons at the bar, with a coupling constant in front. This coupling constant, the quantum coupling, depends on the original parameters of the model, of the Anderson model, or if you want, depends on the value of the energy of the impurity orbital, the U, the interacting energy, and the hybridization. And in terms of these parameters, you can obtain an analytic expression for the condo temperature. Now, the, the nice thing about the analytic expression for the condo temperature is the dependence that it has with this coupling and the density of space available to produce this of the magnetic impurity. So, how do I understand this? Well, this J basically tells me how much the two spins are seeing each other. And the density of state tells me how many electrons do I have to screen the magnetic impurity. Okay? Now, the other thing about this expression is that this is not analytic. 
So there was no way that Kondo, in his perturbative treatment, would obtain uh, exactly this quantity. He obtained it from the divergence of the term, but you cannot deny this because this is not an analytic function of the coupling J or, or the hybridization if you want. So, why to study Kondo when it was measured in the 30s, solved in the 60s by Kondo, solved exactly in the 80s by um, Andrea Bigman? Why go back to Kondo, like so many years afterwards? Well, the physics of Kondo, of impurities interacting with electrons, or the spin spin interactions, had a revival when the techniques that allow us to study surfaces with great detail came into play, mainly SDR, basically, where people could study surfaces, image surfaces, and they decided to start looking, oh, it would be cool if after looking at the surface we come and put the magnetic atom and we see the real space photo state. Can we see something that tells us the formation of this photo state? And in the uh, late 90s, there were pioneer experiments in the group by Mike where he deposited cobalt atoms on silver surfaces and he studied the DIDB, the differential uh, conductance, as a function of the voltage of the sample. And he observed that if he positioned the deep near a non-magnetic impurity, the DIDB didn't have any, any signature. And if he positioned the deep near a magnetic impurity, he started to have this kind of dips. And the dips were interpreted as kind of an interference process from using an STM experiment, you have the, the substrate, and you have the tip, and you have the molecule, the atom in the center. So the electron could go from the tip to the substrate, or could go from the tip to the atom to the substrate. And this could pass, could interfere, giving rise to signals that look like phanon light shapes. And the width of these tips were interpreted as a measure of this condo temperature that represented the condo state formed by the electrons that were connected in purity with the substrate, the ones that were in this path. Later on, this idea was exploited, exploited in, the, in the quantum mirage. In this experiment, they put cobalt atoms forming an ellipse, and they put the magnetic impurity in one foci, and because of the symmetry of the ellipse, if they measure all the signature in, in the foci where the impurity was, they measure a, another signal at the other foci where there was no impurity. And with this, they demonstrated how coherent the electrons were. And the motive of this experiment, the other reason for this experiment, was to try to characterize the size in real space of this effect, what is known as the condo cloud. And they did that by positioning the tip on top of the atom and then moving the tip and measuring here and here and here and here and seeing how the tip, this type of tip, was changing as the tip, as the tip was farther away. And basically, 10 suns from, from the impurity, they saw that the tip was not there. So basically, they said, well, the extension of this condo cloud, if you want the coherence of this state, lasts the order of 10 times. More recently, the idea of manipulating magnetic atoms on top of surfaces were used to, pro to propose switches, condo switches. And this was done by one white colleague of mine at OU. And he manipulates molecules on top of surfaces, and he just implanted the magnetic atom in a molecule. And by changing, bending the molecule, this was like a spider type of molecule. With the STM bit, he would come and do this. He would approach the magnetic molecule to the substrate or put it away, and he could produce the formation of this cold state by wind, basically. And in a more recent experiment, the uh, people started using spin polarized STM, in which the tip of the STM is covered with a material that is magnetizable. So at the end, in the tip, there is a magnetic moment too. And the idea is that these two magnetic moments interact, and by looking at the contrast of the images, they could, they could obtain images of um, magnetic structures. Sorry, I have a question. Yes. So in the first picture, the one that says an undercondor switch, so, don't know if you are, so, which is not the spin polarized. This is not spin polarized, no, no. So, how do you detect it? With the same feature, the DIDB. 
you measure the ID based So when you push, you, the, this magnetic moment touches the signal. Basically, so the signal with the gravity. The idea, the idea is that this forms a signal with the subtract material, right. basically. And when it is far apart, you are setting yeah. the coupling constant to zero. Right. So you don't have photo. And what you measure is something typically like this. That's, that's basically the measure right, 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 okay. yeah. So they have been playing with these photo switches. In graphene, people play the same game not long ago. There was a very publicized manuscript that was never published because it was very controversial, and it was the first attempt to put magnetic atoms on graphene and to try to measure this effect with electrons in graphene specifically. And in this experiment, uh, cobalt atoms were put on top of graphene, and the claim was that they were put on top of the carbon atom or in the center of the hexagon, and very different shapes for the DIDB, the differential conductance, were obtained. Now, the interesting thing was that the, the, the shape of the curves for atoms on top of one carbon atom were roughly, can be roughly explained by the standard Volvo effect that I talked about, but the other ones, when the atom was called, when you put this in the center of the hexagon, represent a, a type of condo that is very unusual. And people have been looking for it for a long time, and it's represented by a non fermi liquid type of physics, which is completely different from the condo physics that I talked about. So, um, this claim was very controversial, and I imagine that's the reason why this manuscript was never published. But this experiment prompted other experimentalists to try to do it again. And there were two attempts that were published, at least as far as I know. One was done by the group of Microbi, the more recent one, in which he tried to put cobalt on graphene, and he measures dips all along. But the behavior of the dips as a function of the sample bias, the magnetic field, and the limited range of temperature that he can explore do not follow the expected behavior of condo in graphene, predicted by theory. So, Chromium et al. associate the presence of this thing to the um, excite, uh, excitation, to a form of excitation that couples to the cobalt atom and does not have any magnetic origin. The other attempt was that not with magnetic impurities, but with vacancies. Graphene was bombarded and holes were created in the graphene stabilities, and this and the, the resistance was measured. It was a typical two terminal resistance as a function of temperature. And the curves were all following the typical prediction for single condo physics in three dimensional materials with no disorder. Okay? So uh, the condo temperature obtained in these experiments had a very clear dependence with the gate voltage that is not understood. And the, the understanding of this experiment in terms of quantum physics also is a little bit controversial because besides being fitted with three-dimensional quantum formula, the other feature is it's not clear what are the states that are playing the role of the magnetic impurity and what is the extent, how localized these states are. So I, I would like to say that up to date there is no clear confirmation that we have observed quantum physics in a field. It's quite an elusive topic. More recently, Eva Gray has been looking at graphene on graphite and graphene on silicon carbide and putting uh, magnetic impurities on top of us. And she has reported data that looks like this. She sees the IV instead of this, she sees peaks. This has to do with the nature of interference between these two paths that I mentioned to be constructive or destructive. But she, she sees two peaks, in which one is always fitted at the Fermi energy. And he, as she associates it with the condo peak, and another one that seems to behave as a localized peak. This is very, these are very preliminary results, and it has uh, the condo peak has a very um, also weird dependence with the with the gate voltage. With with the, it's very different for particles and for holes, which you wouldn't expect in a graphene sample. So although there are some indications that we may be observing condo physics, is by no means any any solved issue. Now let me get layer number three, spin orbit interaction. What is a spin orbit interaction? This particular one is very intuitive. If you remember your classical mechanics, uh, quantum mechanics classes, you may have seen 
this binomial interaction as coming from, as one of the terms added to the hydrogen Hamiltonian as, as a correction. And what's the idea? The idea is that the electron is moving in its orbital motion around the nuclei, and if you sit on top of the electron, that is, you carry your speed with you, you are in the electron rest frame, what you see is that the electric field produced by the nuclei is changing because it's moving. Now, a change in electric field, Maxwell equations, gives me an effective magnetic field, and as such, it couples with my speed. Okay? So, going back to the reference frame of the nuclei, I can write this in terms of the orbital momentum of the electron. And this is why people write the spin orbit interaction as an L dot S term. I, I chose the, the letter sigma here because I will apply this to two dimensions instead of three. Okay? The most important thing about this interaction is that we say it's time reversal invariant. Why? Because time reversal means two t to minus t. Okay? Go backwards in time. Now, if I go backwards in time, I change my momentum p to minus p, but I also change my sense of rotation. So I change p and I change sigma, and the field produced by the, by the ion remains the same, so there is no net change at all, and the interaction is time reversal and barrier. Now, I apply this idea to a two-dimensional material, and I can write this in the language of semi-quantization, in Cartesian coordinates, so I can write it in polar coordinates, and what I like about polar coordinates is that I see that this type of interaction that mixes spins introduces a phase, okay, in the, in the, in the coping term, if you want. This coupling is called the Rashma coupling, and of course it's proportional to this, this electric field that exists in two-dimensional surfaces because there is polarization at surfaces. When you cut the material, the bolts that are loose there, if you want, produce a rearrangement and there is a net, a net electric field pointing out of the surface. Now, what does it do? Well, if I look at the free electron that moves in two dimensions in a parabola that is spin degenerate, so I have two parabolas, one on top of the other, and I add this type of interaction, what happens is that these two parabolas split First of all, because the spin up is not the same as spin down, and they shift. Okay? I notice that there is one point that doesn't move, that is the point with momentum zero, because for momentum zero, this interaction doesn't do anything. And at the end of the day, and then I end up with two different Fermi surfaces in which the spin is always oriented in the direction of the momentum, but in opposite directions in the outer and the inner surface. So, the message of spin orbit interaction is that if you have it in your material, you end up with the spin being not the one to never anymore because the two spins are mixed. Okay? And you end up with different Fermi surfaces with a definite helicity or circulation size. Okay? And this is for free electrons in two dimensional materials. Now, we did that for graphene several years ago, and this is a quarter of the graphene full bar structure because the full thing is very messy. And the dotted blue line is the original energy. This is part of one of the cones. There is another cone here, and this thing goes like this, okay? Just to, to complete the picture. But this is without spin orbit interaction. This is spin degenerate. We apply the spin orbit interaction, and clearly, this bar splits into two, the, this red and this black. They get shifted. The same happens with another bar, it splits into two. And if you zoom in here, what you observe is something like this, which is originated by the fact that below, so this, let's say, is the conduction band. I have the balance band coming from below. The balance band also splits and shifts. And this split and shifting produces band crossing. Okay? The balance band pops up above, and the conduction band goes down. And you can show that this these are new Dirac points in the sense that here the dispersion is linear and that they appear symmetrically positioned with respect to the original Dirac points following the symmetry of the trigonal lattice. So this is basically the effect of uh, spin orbit interactions in graphene. It moves the Dirac points around, it makes new Dirac points, okay? but after that, nothing else changes. 
Now, in order to obtain these, these cells, we did the, the work so in analytic models. We said, okay, let's see if it has some reality. What values of spin orbit do we need to have in graphene? Well, it happens to be gigantic. Graphene doesn't have that kind of spin orbit. Okay, there is no way. The motivation to study the uh, spin orbit in graphene came from these photo experiments because we thought that it has the substrate when inducing these weird photo signals. And the substrate it produces an electric field. So we said perhaps the substrate is producing a rush by affecting graphene, and rush by is affecting the photo signal. That was the motivation for this one. But what we found is that, uh, no, and if it were to do anything, the values of rational constants should have to be enormous. So we went to the literature to see if there were experiments talking about rush by graphene. And we were very happy when we found this work from 2008 where they did ARPES on graphene deposited on nickel, where they changed them, they, they did ARPES, meaning they shoot photons and they measure the upcoming photon, and they magnetized nickel in the bottom. So they magnetized nickel in one direction, they did ARPES. They magnetized nickel in the opposite direction, they did ARPES again, and they measured the intensity of the pi bar, the electron pi bar, and they saw a shift. And they associated that shift, saying, ah, the magnetization of nickel, because of the spin orbit interaction, induces magnetization, polar, spin polarization in graphene. And the state in graphene becomes spin polarized. So that's why, at the energy of these two spin polarized states are different. So we have uh, a spin orbit, a uh, rational type of spin orbit interaction of this magnitude. So apparently, people, this was a little bit lesser, apparently, they, uh, they didn't convince some of their colleagues because another group in Germany decided to repeat the experiment. And to a great surprise, in doing exactly the same thing, they didn't find any shift. And they did even a better experiment doing spin polarized surface where they could measure directly the spin orientation. And they measured zero, zilch, nothing. So they said, if this were true, the electric field at the interface should have, between nickel and, and graphene should have been so big that graphene would have been destroyed. There is no way that this would be due to an electric field at the interface. Okay? So they say there is something else going on here. But these guys apparently got baffled by the possibility of creating spin orbit in graphene. And they decided to keep going and they interpolated gold, which has spin orbit very big because it's a big atom in between graphene and nickel and they were able, repeating the same experiment here, they were able to measure uh, spin orbit constants of the order of 20 millimeter volts and these days they are able to produce of the order of 100 millimeter volts. So perhaps it was so crazy to think about creating spin orbit interactions in graphene by artificial means of the order that you would affect the physics at the Dirac point. Now, what happens when you put the two together? And that was the big question. I said, well, we want to see if this rational had to do anything with the rational, with the condo experiments, to see if the condo could be a scattering mechanism for the spin relaxation garments. Okay? So we went and said, for sure, the question, this question someone must have asked before, because both topics, condo and rational, has been asked for years. Well, to a big surprise, no, it wasn't asked. <laughs> It was very controversial answers going from all over the place since the very first time that the question was posed. When the question was posed, was posed in, in the 69, the, the conclusion was that spin orbit should kill the condor effect because it kills the spin memory and as a consequence this spin fluctuation wouldn't happen. This was experimentalist theory. Uh, in a first approximation, the answer was Spin orbit doesn't do anything to Congo, nothing at all. It's completely leaves Congo in Paris. Another theory calculation says, well, it cannot do anything because it's a universal invariant. The spin up and down, the fluctuation, what we call up and down is arbitrary. Up and down could be like this too. And what spin orbit does is just changes the direction of quantization, nothing else, but doesn't change the fluctuation. Solution in an approximate limit. Solution in an approximate limit. A more recent paper claimed that, oh yeah, spin orbit does do something in the condo. It changes the condo temperature by every factor. Okay? 
and it was also in an effective mode. So before jumping into graphene, we decided to solve this problem, but basically said, well, to the bath of free electrons, let's add a spin orbit interaction and let's solve it. So we solved it, and we said, well, without a spin orbit interaction, we will have what is normally called a one-channel simple code of physics, because we have only one type of electrons that can couple to an S1 half impurity. S1 half means angular momentum and equal zero. There are only those electrons who can see the impurity whose wave function will have overlap. Now that I have spin orbit, I have two bands. So my expectation, my naive expectation, would have to say, ah, there may be two bands competing now to split impurities. Let's solve the problem. Well, to make a long story short, you solve the problem doing a schiffer wall transformation and doing all the, all the math, and you obtain the standard bond of Hamiltonian, but plus you also obtain an extra term, which is also a spin, spin interaction, but of a different sort. While this is a scalar, this is a vector. Basically, this aligns the spins in a particular way. And I took the liberty to take this picture from a colleague of mine who is completely uh, independent of this, but conveys the idea that electrons in the bus have their spin turning in this order way as they approach the impurity. Okay? And they, they are turning in such a way that when they approach the impurity, they approach it with the right spin orientation in order to be scattered. And they circle back again. So, is that effect important? To see if that effect was important, we did uh, numerical normalization group calculation, which is the numerical method to solve the combo problem exactly and to be able to make predictions. And when we did that, you can see that the original parabolic structure that gets split into two has a very peculiar feature because it develops a back -house singularity at the final momentum. So if I look at the density of state for this red bar, you see that the density of state is practically constant, but when it hits this value, it goes up and it increases a lot, while the density of state for the other bar disappears. So basically, if I, I position my chemical potential in the right place, I will be able to see only the effect of this bar that has a huge density of state, and as such, I will have a huge effect on the condo temperature. So the answer to the question was, yes, spin orbit affects condo physics, doesn't destroy the condo effect, the condo effect still takes place, but there is an exponential enhancement of the condo temperature. So if you want to observe the condo physics, you better put your system on a substrate that has strong spin orbit interaction, because this is the way to enhance condo physics. Now, what happens in graphene? We repeat the whole Shabash graphene, and I have two minutes to go through it. In graphene, the expectation is that nothing will happen because the density of state in graphene is linear and it vanishes at the Dirac point. This was a problem that was a long time ago, and basically the conclusion is unless you have a very, very strong interaction, attraction between the electrons at impurity and the electrons in the bath, and you have electrons in the bath, so you are above the, the zero of energy, you will have a condo temperature that goes linear instead of exponential with the coupling. It's a very, very weak effect because you have few electrons to form this screen state. There is a very nice review for this in, in last year in the review of modern physics where all this story is uh, uh, described. Now, we did that for graphene and what you observe in graphene is that this splitting and shifting that is really minimized. Here is where the, the three dark points appear, and if this quantity is very small, you don't see that splitting, but you see the splitting between the bands. We solve that problem, which basically means having the cones became, uh, becoming like curved, like this. What you see is that the density of state becomes finite at zero energy. So instead of having a vanishing density of state, what spin orbit does is introduce a finite amount of density of state here, which means that you can have auto effect. So, in other words, without partial spin orbit, there is no condo effect in graphene, at least in theory. If you put a little bit of partial spin orbit, you immediately have a density of state, and as such, you can develop condo physics. You can turn this statement around. You can say, oh, if I see condo physics, 
Then there may be a litigation, but I have some type of spinoral interaction going on because I have a finite density of state. What produces a finite density of state? Of ethylene and electrons. This has to be electrons that can move, not localized. So, finally, I just want to mention that we did the same thing in bilayer because bilayer has a very similar density of state. So you say, oh, we kill two birds in one stone, meaning two papers in our language, right? We solve the problems. To our big surprise, <laughs> We said, oh, this is simple, this is the density of state. When you put impurity between two layers of graphene that are invernal stacking, the most common configurations of my layer. But when you do that, what you find out is that the hydrogenization function, which is the function that really connects the impurity and the electrons, is not only the, the density of state, it's very weird, extremely weird. It's very particle ball symmetric because when you put impurity, you break the symmetry between the two layers, okay? So it becomes what you call asymmetric. And when we study this with numerical normalization, though, we found a plethora of different phases and different characteristics. So we characterize this very well. There are a lot of curves that really don't, don't have much meaning. So these are the conclusions that I want you to take home, basically, that if you have an Anderson impurity model, or a condo model with a rush bar, you recover the standard condo interaction, but with an exponential enhancement as the condo temperature. If you do that in graphene, what you discover is that you can tune your condo effect with spinolytic interactions. And if you do condo in bilayer, or when you put impurity markers, because this feature of the hybridization is not coming from the density of state, it's coming from the coupling between impurity and electrons, the term V, the hybridization constant. And the symmetry of that function is the plays a big role in the this. So these are uh, people who heavily collaborated in this work, with who did the work. Mani was uh, responsible for the Russia part of graphene. Arturo, Arturo uh, Antiero did the, the work responsible for the bilayer and the condo in graphene. See, that's the time that when I, I go and for my daughter at school, I'm a Russian. <laughs> so these two were the Rashman Kondo, uh, Rashman, uh, sorry, Kondo and Graphene, Rashman Kondo and Graphene and Bilayer. And uh, this is the expert in NRD who has been uh, collaborating with us. It's really a good friend. And this is the other collaborator who happens to live in my household too. So uh, that's it. Questions, please. Yes. So you talked about rash by here. What about different types of spin or interaction? Well, uh, the easiest way we didn't we didn't do others uh, again because um, the reason to study rash was uh, motivated by the effect of the substrate, and the, the natural thing to expect is this electric field popping up. Um, at that time, we weren't clear enough to understand that you can get a result without solving the problem. By just looking at the symmetries and, and just identifying what, what happens with the density of state, which is the big effect here. Um, so from that point of view, um, I would say that other type of electron electron uh, other type of spin-orbit interactions would have a similar effect because they do not break time reversal, and as long as they don't break the parity of the field, the parity, the layer, no, the, the mirror symmetry the layer, they, they uh, belong to the same class of rashmas. So in that sense, they sh there should be a, a regime of parameters in which you would have this exponential enhancement of the condo temperature. So I don't expect any. Yes. They are treated the quantization axis, basically. Yes. Experimentally, is anyone looking at this on suspended graphene with localized defects? No, not, that I am, not, not that I am aware of. Not that I am aware. <coughs> Apparently, it's very tough to get the atoms attached to the field. They diffuse, and that's why people are putting hydrogen or are making holes, because at least they are there. They, they. But apparently, if you try to deposit cobalt or, or the typical uh, manganese, the other one, uh, it's very mobile. So, and this is the reason why Chromi thinks that he's exciting phonon inside of membrane, in, in the graphene membrane, where he deposits the cobalt because the cobalt is not really attached, it's not hybridizing. 
videographers. Um, yeah, that's as far as I know. The, the latest of Kondo that, uh, that has been reported are these results by, by Eva Gray, which are still very, very green, I would say, very uh, uncertain. The fact that she sees, uh, you see, when you study one of the features of this, uh, this hybridization function, when the hybridization function has a gap like this, uh, and when you, you, when you saw that for the condo problem, you find in this region the typical condo features, but inside the gap you also find features that you naively would have associated with the condo effect. And when you study them more closely, what you discover is that this, the state of the gap corresponds to a localized state. Why a localized state? Because all the time that I have been talking about condo, I make you think about the impurity, the spin-spin interaction. But you have a big fat impurity there. It's a scalar potential. It can bind two, right? So it can localize the state. And this is what we discover happens here. And this feature here that gets very close to the condo peak can be mistaken. So we find very interesting that she finds that she finds this peak here. Because she claims that this peak looks like a localized peak. However, in our calculation, this peak should appear exactly symmetrically when you, you apply the voltage in the opposite direction, and she doesn't see two peaks when she applies the voltage in the opposite direction. So it's not clear at all if this is a condo peak, and this may be a localized speed, but then that means that the hybridization has a gap, which means that the graphene has a gap, and then the question is where is that gap coming from? Uh, the other feature, the, the problem with Kondo in STM, in this type of systems, is that it's very, very difficult to pinpoint that it's really Kondo, that the peak represents Kondo, because um, the checks that you normally do on a Kondo peak, to check that if it corresponds to a Kondo state, which is a blind magnetic field, or change the temperature, it's very, very, well, the temperature is out of the question in SDR, in, in the range that you would need to check the scaling fraction. And the magnetic field, not all the, not all the STMs can apply magnetic field in the range where you can see the splitting. So you have to really argue in STM that this is really due to power. And here I don't think that the case has been made yet. So I can ask you what more. So I'm a bit confused about the technology of the exponential enhancement. So you imagine with the spinner, so you imagine that the chemical potential is at zero, right? Mm -hmm. So you imagine that the zero doping and you cannot have a condo effect at all. So then on top of that zero, zero condo temperature, you have an exponentially small additional effect, right? So but if you if we started from already finite chemical potential, you would have some condo temperature. So the relativistic part probably will be smaller than that, right? In one way or the other, lambda r is proportional to 1 over the speed of light, right? So, no. I mean, it's a relativistic uh, effect, right? No. no. To see the has no, that's the thing. If you keep the linear term in lambda, so the, the, the only lambda, first order in lambda mm -hmm. term, uh, you don't get the has You don't get the three Dirac points. Basically, right. to see this, this, this true effect, you need to go to lambda q. Okay, I'll ask you about that too. Yeah. Okay, because I also know, I mean, remember from the Russian theoretical yeah, war, yeah. that you cannot really have yeah. much effect at finding the chemical potential. Because, again, you reverse every diagram in time back and forth, uh -huh, exactly. and all these logs, they remain the same, and then so on. But well, of course, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, but the fact that the, the, what you have, you have, okay, let me see if I can. Or maybe I. But also when you say enhancement, you mean enhancement on top of zero, right? I mean, you imagine that... Yeah, compared the to the previous one without no, the rush by yeah, one zero. Yeah, yeah. exactly. If, if you didn't have... No, but the rush to zero and zero chemical potential, right? No, 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 no. no? Suppose that you have... No, look at the... Look at the this is a free electron mass. This is a, a quadratic dispersion, okay? Mm -hmm. Simply free electrons, this is your bar. 
okay? If you have zero chemical potential, that means that you are here, you don't have any electrons in this case. Right. Okay? Because you are sitting at the, at the bottom of the bar. No electrons, nothing happens. Right. Now, you, put the chemi you need to put the chemical potential a little bit higher, which is, let's say, where the zero is. Okay? Right. Right. Now, when you apply Rashla, this, this parabolic thing becomes two. And the fact is that this one has the Bacon similarity at the finite gain. And that finite gain is given by lambda r. Okay. This, this minimum in energy is here. And this is what I refer by the enhancement of the density of state. So what is happening here? I like to think that at the beginning I have my electrons up and down. Now I put Rashba. I have them like going into circles, let's say clockwise and anticlockwise. Let's see if I get this right. Now, when I put the chemical potential, when I only see the, the red bar, I only have clockwise. There is no way that with this alone, I can form an up. I need both to form an up. Okay? So I, I somehow, I have half of my electrons, if you want. Uh, okay, so it's a true exponential. But it's okay. a true exponential encounter. Yeah, because I am eliminating part of the... Yeah. Yeah. More questions, please. Yes. So, uh, coming back to this uh, idea of this condo effect, so as by literature, by, by history, so said that it's anti ferromagnetic. So, what about having a ferromagnetic condo effect? Uh, so, instead of. Come on! Shh! Shh! And this is because I always forget. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, it's not the singular ground state, the triplet being the ground state. And so, for example, there can be materials like, I mean, I'm asking, are there any, uh, in literature, are there any works where they say having a, a graphene on top of some ferromagnetic metal, uh, in the sense of like rarer, not the, not the usual transition metal, where, uh, where such effect can be uh, pronounced. That is the one which is ferromagnetic, because ferromagnetic on the, uh, uh, which is much more, uh, experimentally also hopefully accessible uh, to measure as well, compared I, to the anti ferromagnetic one. I, um, I don't know, uh, uh, for sure I don't know about the experimental work. I know that that people have been look at uh, the, the combo effect with ferromagnetic leads and uh, in graphene with ferromagnetic leads. And uh, if I remember correctly, they didn't see anything unusual uh, that expected. Uh, the condo in graphene, the, the first paper of condo in graphene was by, by Tatiana Rapport and Tom and Bruno Ochoa, as far as I know, and they predicted the existence of this local magnetic moment, which means it's the absence of condo, right? The, the, the local magnetic moment gets, even when you have attachment, when you go down the map, they become free, basically, and they don't see the electrons in the bath anymore. And after that, uh, no, I am not aware of, of any particular thing. So within Rajpa, if you add up, uh, there is nothing special uh, polarized term which additionally appears. No. Nothing like that. Okay. No. No. Thank you. No. One final question, please. Question? If not, let's take this speaker again.